Uh, this paper really addresses two central questions. Uh, first, uh, how does the composition of local banking markets, and specifically whether they're dominated by big banks versus community banks, how does that affect uh, low-income households' access to credit? And the second question is, uh, how does the composition of local banking markets uh, have any long-run effects on economic inequality? Uh, the reason I'm asking this question is, as you know, there's been a tremendous amount of consolidation in the banking industry. Uh, this figure looks at that from households perspective over the last 20 years or so. Uh, so what we're doing is looking at the size of the banks that own the branches within 10 miles of where a household lives. And what we'll see if we look at the left axis and the black line is that the fraction of those branches that are owned by small banks is steadily declining. And the size of the average bank in, that, in those areas is, is increasing. So households are interacting with larger financial institutions than ever before. And this leads to the question of, well, do large banks lead to more or less credit access for these households? On the one hand, larger banks may lead to more credit uh, because they benefit from economies of scale and diversification, which could let them lend out more capital. Uh, but on the other hand, as banks become larger, they typically have to adopt a more hierarchical structure, uh, and that can lead to a comparative disadvantage uh, use of utilizing soft information. Uh, and this has been shown particularly uh, the theoretically and empirically in the small business lending setting, where smaller banks are incredibly important providers of credit to small businesses, uh, but it hasn't received as much attention on the household finance side of things. And so I want to point out that there is this asymmetry to notice here, which is that uh, if banks are becoming larger and providing less credit, that argument holds uh, most steadily for households or, or people who rely on soft information for their credit access. And against that backdrop, I'd like to talk to you about the three key findings of my study. Uh, so first, I find that low-income households have better access to credit when local banks are smaller, when you have more community banks in an area. This analysis is based on credit bureau data, looking at a nationally representative panel of households, and you can see uh, they're borrowing uh, in things like auto loans, mortgages, personal installment loans, etc. The second major finding is that community banks' additional lending to low-income households stems from the connection to their community, from an advantage at utilizing soft information in their lending process. Uh, and this analysis is based on Home Mortgage uh, Disclosure Act data on mortgage applications. And then this leads to the third finding, which is that improved credit access for lower-income families leads to higher levels of intergenerational economic mobility. In other words, uh, the children from these lower income families have better outcomes later in life uh, when their parents had better access to credit as they were growing up. And this analysis is based on new county level uh, measures in mobility uh, that come from uh, great work by Chetty and his co-authors. And so this first finding is that community banks improve low income households access to credit. It can really be summed up in, in one figure here. Uh, so let's look at the left plot first. Here we're looking at higher income or prime borrowers. On the y-axis, we have uh, their residual credit approval. So I've controlled for things like their credit score, their income, and a host of other characteristics. And this is basically the unexpected uh, success rate when they're shopping for credit of various types of credit. And on the x-axis, we're plotting the, uh, the size of the local banks. And what we see is that for higher income prime borrowers, there's not really a relationship between bank size and their approval rates. They can get credit uh, almost, you know, in any circumstances. Whereas when you look at the right plot here, where a, a strong relationship emerges for these subprime or lower income borrowers, which is that when there's a, a stronger presence of community banks, when you have smaller local banks, they have a much higher uh, chance of receiving credit. Uh, and this basic effect is, is both fairly large and robust and holds in a variety of settings. So the main takeaway is that a standard deviation increase in the local large bank market share. So I'm measuring that as the, the fraction of the bank branches within 10 miles of where the individual household lives that are owned by big banks. Right? Uh, so a standard deviation increase in this large bank market share reduces these subprime borrowers' approval rates by about four percentage points. That's off of a mean approval rate of about 50%. And they face that reduction in credit year after year after year. Right? Uh, and again, so this holds using OLAS estimation or an instrumental variables approach uh, that hinges on differences in regulation across states and state borders in, uh, in, to identify things. Uh, and you also see some of the spillover effects you'd expect to, to see if banks, if the largest banks are, are uh, credit rationing, 
which is that uh, these lower income borrowers are more likely to borrow on expensive sources of credit, uh, like retail credit cards, when the local banks are, are exclusively large. And this brings us to our second finding, which is that uh, community banks' uh, additional lending uh, is based on an advantage using soft information. So this can again be summed up in, in one figure. Uh, so this is looking at basically the raw data uh, that's coming from the Home Mortgage Disclosure Act and mortgage applications. On the y-axis, we're looking at the approval rate on, on mortgage loans. Uh, on the x-axis, we're looking at the distance uh, between where the person's trying to buy a house and the bank's nearest branch. And this is split based on small and large banks. And what we see is that large banks, there's essentially no relationship between the distance to the nearest branch and the credit approval rates. Then when we look at small bank lending, right, the dark circles here, right, first of all, they, they are more likely to prove, uh, prove mortgages overall, which is uh, consistent with incorporating more information. But this wedge grows, especially as you get uh, to loans that are made close to their bank branches, which is suggesting that they're using their ties to the community, uh, their, the, their knowledge of the customer base, uh, and soft information in order to incorporate more information into the origination process. And when you run more rigorous tests that carefully control for the characteristics of, of the applications, uh, you'll find that the effective distance is more than twice as large at small banks versus large banks. Distance matters much more, uh, three times more for low income versus high income applicants. And despite originating these ad additional loans and approving more loans, small banks uh, loans do not default more. And all of these findings are consistent with uh, small banks incorporating more soft information and that information being most critical for the lowest income applicants. And now well, we get to talk about intergenerational economic mobility, the third part of this paper. Well, what is it? Mobility describes the disparity in outcomes between children from low uh, versus high income families. And you can think of it as a measure of equality of opportunity in an economy. Uh, and so a common way to describe it is to look at the relationship between children's income and their parents' income. And so in this figure here on the y-axis, we have the place in the income distribution that a child ends up. And on the x-axis, we have the place in the income distribution that, where their parent was. And so if we thought of, you know, what if we had a 45-degree line here, a, one, a slope of one, right? That would tell us that every child ended up in the exact same spot in the income distribution as their parents, right? As we start to flatten that slope, there's more quality of opportunity. Children from low-income families are reaching more equal outcomes later in life compared to children from high-income families. And when you look at this across countries, you'll actually see that uh, despite being the home of the American dream, the U.S. tends to have lower intergenerational mobility levels than most other developed nations. And there is tremendous variation in upper mobility within the United States. And so here, uh, the darker shaded regions are areas where there's less mobility. You can see that's in the south, parts of the Ohio River Valley, and large parts of the west coast as well. And there are a lot of institutional and historical factors uh, at play here. And the Chetty et al. paper does a great job of outlining them and carefully characterizing them. Uh, and so I'm going to control for all of the non-banking factors that they outline and try to isolate the effect of banking and credit access on these upward mobility levels. And here we have a really clear reason to believe uh, that credit access should facilitate upward mobility. The basic intuition is that parents are constantly trying to invest in their children, build up their human capital, and have them have positive life outcomes. For lower income families, it might be more difficult to finance that directly out of their wages and to smooth their consumption with their investment in their children. So any access to finance, any alleviation of financial constraints, should work to facilitate that investment in children, and that should be especially powerful for lower income families. Some examples would be, well, if you can purchase a home, you can move to a nicer neighborhood, uh, you can get into a better school district, that can have tremendous effects on your child. Other examples, things like daycare, after school activities, uh, college prep, summer internships versus taking a job to earn cash. All of these are situations where some funding uh, can facilitate investment in children. And sources of finance are fungible. If you get uh, an auto loan, right, that means you don't have to pay for that uh, car up front. You can use the financing to continue your investments in your children. So the analysis is going to carefully control for non-banking factors and isolate the effect of uh, local bank composition using an instrumental variables approach that takes advantage of historical differences in the timing of interstate deregulation. 
which basically uh, led to the formation of, of national banks. And this third finding is that by providing credit to lower income families, community banks facilitate upward mobility as they're alleviating the, the parents' credit constraints in these families. The outcome variable here is a transition rate out of the bottom 40%. So I look for children who are born to families in the bottom 40% of income distribution, and I look at their likelihood of transitioning out of that 40, bottom 40% as an adult. The average transition probability is about 50%. A standard deviation increase in the large bank market share in the area can reduce that by about four percentage points. So when you have smaller community banks lending to these low-income households, it facilitates upward economic mobility. I just want to recap by saying the main findings are that these community banks are incorporating more soft information, which makes them incredibly important providers of credit to low-income families. That's facilitating upward mobility. And a final thought is that I think financial institutions' role in economic inequality is at, at the current moment understudied and I think is a tremendously promising area for future work. And so thank you so much for the opportunity to be here today.